It's Java time. More specifically, how Netflix uses Java. Because if you didn't know, everything at Netflix is built on Java, which may come as a surprise to this guy who called Java a dead programming language. And if I had to guess, y'all didn't watch this 47 minute video or the 50 minute video from the year before or the hour and five minute video from the year before that because your attention span is the same length as a for loop with a break condition inside of TikTok. I bet if they had Subway Surfer gameplay on one half of the screen, you would have watched all three. But never fear, here I am to nerd out about how Netflix actually does use Java because it is fascinating. But let's start with the first misconception here, and that is the statement of everything at Netflix is built on Java. Because for front end, it's whatever makes most sense for your device. iPhone, you're gonna use Swift. Uh, web, you're going to use JavaScript, or hopefully TypeScript. Whatever the heck the TV uses, except for Android, because that one's Java. But not really, but kind of. Kotlin. A Paul even jokes about it. But the UI is just in whatever language is most fit for the device you're on. So if you're on a TV that is uh, different from a mobile device, but none of it is Java, maybe except Android because that's kind of Java, but not really. What is Java based is the backend, and I mean all of it. Like Netflix the streaming platform, Netflix the movie studio, Netflix the production equipment tracker. All of it runs on Java. And Netflix has two main kinds of applications. One is streaming apps. That's what, when you think of Netflix, that's what you think of. That's the user facing high RPS requests per second, millions of users, insane distributed systems. And then the other is probably what you're building at your company, but what Netflix builds internally, like studio apps and calendars, equipment, spreadsheets, film production stuff. So low RPS, this is low traffic applications, much more traditional, same architecture, but wildly different failure tolerances. Because on the streaming side, Paul says, But we can get away with just retrying on failure for the most part. And if that doesn't work, we can often just um, return a response to the device with maybe some data missing. But for the most part, you as a user won't even notice. Because you won't even notice. If there's a, a recommendation that's supposed to be there, but it's not, how are you gonna know it's supposed to be there? But for the studio side, if you are in movie uh, planning, for example, and you have to um, have to save some data from your UI, it's not acceptable that the data just disappears. Um, yes, that makes a whole lot of sense because you kind of need that information. And what's interesting is about the streaming apps are non-relational databases, whereas the studio apps are, you know, your typical relational databases because the former, the type of data they store just doesn't fit right in it. But let's talk about the backend architecture. So here's how it works in like a nice little example. And that is you open Netflix on your TV. That sends a single GraphQL query to an API gateway. The query gets broken up and fanned out to a bunch of microservices. All of those microservices respond and then the gateway smashes those responses together. And you see what to watch next. Paul explains. So although from the uh, perspective of the device, there's like one giant GraphQL schema, in fact, that schema is implemented by many different backend services. Those backend services, they communicate with gRPC. And some of you may not like me saying this, but the reason they do that is because REST is too slow. Uh, gRPC is fast, it's binary, it's schema-based, which is exactly what Netflix needs. So if you're still building REST APIs, Paul has some words for you. Well, I don't think you should use REST at all, really. Because GraphQL is their front end to back end API of choice, and gRPC again is their service to service choice. And REST is for quick and dirty hacks, and that's really it. I'm not saying you are a bad person if you ever do REST, you're just not as good as a person. But if you want to be a good person, shop at Micro Center, a longtime partner of the channel and PC Mag's number one tech retailer of the year for 2024. And the month of May is Desktop Deals Month at Micro Center. I mean, look at all these deals. You have pre-built, you have all-in-ones, you have mini PCs. So if you're looking to upgrade or outfit your office or you wanna build a cluster with those mini PCs, this is the month to do it if you want the best possible deals. Oh, and a quick heads up, Micro Center Santa Clara is opening very soon. And I'm gonna be there for the grand opening. So if you're in the area, one, sign up for early access, so you can get a free 128 gigabyte flash drive. And if you're there the same time as me, well, come say hi, because for the first person who does, I have something for you from Micro Center. 
And if you've never been to Micro Center, it's, it's kind of like a Disneyland for PC builders and tech enthusiasts. You can get any PC component, pre-built computers, monitors, keyboards, whatever peripherals you dream of, as well as they have a maker section. All of these at the best prices you could find anywhere. Or if you're shopping online, regardless of the month, definitely check out their top deals right here for top desktop deals, PC parts, SSD, and you're able to click on this and shop all of their top deals at any time. Links for everything I mentioned here are going to be in the description below. And huge thanks to Micro Center for being an amazing partner of the channel. I briefly mentioned this, but it's important the way Netflix uses data. It's mostly distributed data stores. Things like EV Cash, Cassandra, Kafka. Why? because relational databases don't scale well across multiple AWS regions and their streaming apps are multi-region. They're on uh, four different Amazon regions and that is just so that wherever you are in the world, um, you have very low latency to our backend services. Even their streaming hardware runs Java. On the same note as all of that, when you hit play, when you're watching Netflix and you hit play on a show, it doesn't stream from California. It streams from a Netflix server rack inside your local ISP. Netflix quite literally ships hard drives full of popular content to ISPs globally. That whole Open Connect system, also managed by Java, by the way, just saying. Open Connect is all the management software around there. Um, it's also all Java based. So yeah, even the bits flying to your TV are Java powered. Now the next part is going to blow your minds. If you're a Java dev, it really is, I promise. They, Netflix, successfully and willingly upgraded from Java 8, from JDK 8 to JDK 17 a handful of years ago, which Paul was like, hey, it's uh, pretty embarrassing because we had kind of worked ourselves a little bit in a hole. We had an outdated uh, application framework that was developed many years ago. That was all kind of in-house built. We were using a lot of old libraries that uh, we had ne never updated because we didn't want to break anyone's apps. And these libraries were now incompatible with any Java versions newer than JDK 8. So service owners couldn't easily upgrade. That was just not a great story. And how'd they fix it? They patched all of the old libraries themselves, even ones that are no longer supported. There was like a handful of libraries that we needed to patch. It wasn't that much work, so we just got it done. Yeah, not that much work. Super easy. He actually said, you know, it may be daunting to update some of these libraries that are, have been abandoned or what have you, but it's really not. I mean, he is also a staff software engineer at Netflix, so it may be easy for him. I don't know if it's easy for everybody else. I'm not sure. But what definitely wasn't easy is the fact that they migrated all of their services to Spring Boot. This is over 3,000 apps. So now all their services are on Spring Boot, all services are on JDK 17 or higher with most high RPS on JDK 23. And once they got to JDK 17, they immediately started seeing improvements. So they used G1 GC and they saw 20% less CPU spent on garbage collection just by going from JDK 8 to JDK 17. But then when JDK 21 came out, they upgraded to generational ZGC. That directly reduced error rates. So that's really impressive. We went from like more than a second pass times to zero. And that directly reduced error rates. These garbage collection events would previously cause timeouts. And when these garbage collection events don't happen, these timeouts also don't happen. And here's why. Netflix services are tuned with aggressive timeouts. If a GC pause takes more than a second, Every incoming call times out and retries. That causes more load, more failures, more insanity, chaos. But with Gen ZGC, it reduces all this retry behavior. It makes your services just run a little bit more consistent. It's easier to operate, easier to understand. And they also have some services hold on to large objects basically forever. Think long lived caches or lookup tables. So having a generational collector avoids sweeping the whole heap every cycle. Or translation, better garbage collector, better uptime, smoother traffic, and um, a better dev life because you're not worried about it too much. And now virtual threads. Netflix is super bullish on virtual threads. My hot take still is that virtual threads combined with structured concurrency is going to completely replace reactive programming. Which I find hilarious because Netflix are quite literally the ones that invented Rx Java and they ditched it, which I can fully appreciate. If there's a better alternative, especially one that's built into the language, there's no reason to keep this obsolete thing that is not as good alive just because you built it. 
And about RxJava, he says, And also a lot of complexity to your debugging. And we found that in most cases, the trade-off is just not a good one. And we backed out of using reactive programming for the most part. And basically, no one wants to touch it. So instead, they rewrote their frameworks to use virtual threads by default. That way devs get parallelism, which is always a hard word for me to say, parallelism for free, no completable features needed, and they'll also benefit from virtual threads without even knowing it. But what they did know or notice is um, it, when it blew up. Our cluster started to completely deadlock, uh, as in we would have instances that would just be completely dead. And that is JDK24 fixed that. They did a full rewrite of the synchronization mechanism, Java that is, Oracle. So now Netflix is back on the virtual thread hype train because the issues have been solved. And I'm also curious at how many issues that Netflix faces, probably because Netflix, the, maybe the biggest proponent of Java in the sense that they are using it on a scale larger than most, if not all others, were having trouble with it. And if they're having trouble with it, other people probably are too, so Java's gonna get on it fast. And all of Netflix Java runs on a custom Spring Boot stack, which is just regular Spring Boot plus Netflix specific modules. Security, observability, service mesh integration, gRPC support, fast properties, which is runtime config changes without restarts. And something many of y'all could uh, take note of when Spring Boot releases a new minor version, Netflix upgrades everything within days. But to be fair, they also work with the Spring team directly, so maybe they have a little bit of a head start, I'm not exactly sure. They contribute features, they collaborate on GraphQL, they're, they're shaping the future roadmap of Spring Boot. The Spring team is just a really good partner for us. So yeah, Netflix isn't just using Java, they're not just using Spring Boot, they are, they're, they're a huge factor in how it's progressing and how it's moving forward. And not just how it is, but they're doing it themselves with all the contributions and things of that nature. Anything else in the Java ecosystem with old libraries that they have updated and maintained themselves. And they're doing all of this on a massive scale. That's also including open sourcing frameworks, tuning garbage collectors, all the other stuff that we talked about. And all of this is, it's just the types, I find it so interesting. I don't know, maybe I'm a weirdo. I mean... I dress like this for a video, so I'm definitely a weirdo, but like, it's not just theoretical or it's not just looking at the language and seeing what could be done. It's, it's, it's real world. One of the biggest applications that you can imagine actually implementing all of these cool new features. And it's also awesome to see them not be stuck on Java 8, like your banking software and your health software and Java, if you were one of the comments that said, oh, I'm never watching Netflix again because they use Java, well, <laughs> you're going to have to stop using a lot of software that you use on a regular basis if you want to get away from Java. And before you know it, you'll start dressing like me. But if you like this breakdown, I really liked it. I, probably just because it is Java. I think Uber uses a lot of Go. I've been dabbling in Go lately. I have nowhere near as much experience in Go. But it would be fascinating to do some more of these breakdowns. I don't know. Eh, for now, just do all the YouTube stuff, subscribe. Yeah, hit that like button. It's non-blocking, I promise. And if you don't, then I'll pin your main thread with synchronized. Just do it. Just do it. It helps. Actually, I have no proof of that. I'm not, I'm not even sure it helps. Anyway, I'm just rambling at this point. Hope you enjoyed the video. Goodbye.